Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in the Lockheed Martin Auditorium at the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center at U.S. Naval Institute. I'm Robin Noonan, Sales and Marketing Director for Naval Institute Press. We're fortunate on this homecoming weekend to have two esteemed authors who are Naval Academy alumni whose books Naval Institute Press has published. Mr. Mark Trainer, whose novel of the Vietnam War and its aftermath, A Quiet Cadence, has received three prestigious literary prizes. And Rear Admiral James McNeil, lead author of The Herndon Climb, which recounts a rite of passage every commissioned midshipman has experienced, will join Marine Captain Zach Blanchard in conversation. Captain Blanchard has graciously agreed to moderate. Some housekeeping rules, please. If you haven't already, please silence your phones. We will be recording this discussion and will soon upload it to U.S. Naval Institute's YouTube channel. After Captain Blanchard's conversation with the authors, a brief audience Q&A will follow. At 12.15 or thereabouts, we'll invite all attendees topside to the rooftop terrace where they may purchase books if they haven't already, have their books signed by authors, and continue the conversation. Since it is lunchtime, there will be lunch for everyone here. We're mindful of your busy homecoming calendar, so we'll keep on schedule and get you to the soups on time. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Let the discussion begin. Zach, I'll turn this over to you. Okay, so uh, to my left, we have Mr. Mark Trainer, uh, a Naval Academy graduate who is a Marine Rifle Platoon leader in Vietnam, an artillery battery commander, back when that transition was a thing. Um, and a leadership instructor and later served on the boards of the National Defense University and the Naval Academy. A lawyer, corporate executive, and leadership coach, he has participated in national security fact-finding missions in Iraq, Yemen, Africa, and the Caucasus. He lives in both Maryland and Vermont. His book, A Quiet Cadence, has received three prestigious literary prizes, the W.Y. Boyd Award for Military Fiction, the William Colby Award, and the Military Writer Society of America Gold Medal. Mr. Trainer, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, sir. Good to be here. And then to my right, we have Rear Admiral James McNeil, who graduated from the Naval Academy in 1986 and holds a Master's of Science in Organizational Management from Shadron State Uni College. His most recent assignment was Commander of NAFSUP, Global Logistics Support, headquarters to a network of eight fleet logistics centers around the world that provide an extensive array of integrated global logistics and contracting services to Navy and joint operational units across all warfare enterprises. He lives in Maryland with his wife, Dr. Peggy McNeil. His book, The Herndon Climb, A History of the United States Naval Academy's Greatest Tradition, was published in 2020. He currently has a second work of nonfiction uh, currently in development. In retirement, uh, Admiral McNeil teaches the Youngster Ethics course at the Naval Academy as the defensive coordinator for the Navy Sprint football team, who recently beat Army in the Star Game 14-6. <laughs> Admiral, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Zach. All right, so starting off in these, uh, the first couple questions will be for both of you. So number one, writing a book is a major time commitment. What made you decide to undertake it? And did you ever have a moment where you doubted you would or could finish your book? Starting with Mr. Trainer. Oh, OK. Um, I had uh, been writing for probably 30 years. Um, you know, kind of intermittently here and there, uh, never published anything. Um, since I left the Naval Academy, I, uh, and uh, all of the, uh, I had written three previous novels. Uh, first one was terrible, second one was okay, third one I thought was pretty decent, but it didn't go anywhere. And then uh, after a lag of a few years, I sat and I thought about what I really wanted to talk about. And I decided that uh, what I wanted to do was write a book from the point of view of a veteran talking about his combat experience in the years afterwards. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of great war novels out there. I'm not aware of any book, any novel that talks about both an authentic depiction of ground combat uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, um, uh, what the aftermath of the war is and, and what uh, guys and now gals carry with them when, uh, uh, when they come home after uh, 
after having been in a pretty intense situation. And part of the impetus for that was that I had done a bunch of work with veterans and, and I'd also read a lot about uh, veterans, including just, you know, the headlines in the Washington Post and other places. And I thought there was a, a really unfortunate uh, and unfair perception of combat veterans, not just from Vietnam, but even from uh, our more recent wars. And uh, I wanted to to say something about that in the book. And so that's why it's bifurcated with the first part of the book is, is about uh, uh, the protagonist's time in Vietnam and the second part's after he came home. Thank you, sir. Alan McNeil. So I have a co-author, Scott Tomaszewski, and he's not able to be here today. Uh, he and I have known each other since 1975. We met as seventh graders. And the, we've been friends ever since. And, and the genesis of our book was I got a call. I was at GLS, as Zach said, my last Navy job. And I got a call from Scott. And he said, hey, I was watching SportsCenter. And they had a top, the top 10 list. And one of the top 10 items was a thing at the Naval Academy called the Herndon Climb. He said, have you ever heard of it? <laughs> and I said, yes, I've heard of it. Uh, and it was the second best day of my life. And he said, well, I think it would make a really, really great book. And then he proceeded to share his vision. And as he shared his vision, uh, and he's written some other books, self-published some books, uh, a time uh, travel series that's really excellent. Uh, it, you can, it's available on Amazon, free plug for Scott. But as he went on, I thought to myself, I know there's books on Herndon. I know Scott's excited to write it, but my thought is I don't want to spend a lot of time writing the seventh book about Herndon. So as he's talking, I jumped on my computer and I Googled, I went on Amazon and I Googled uh, or looked up Herndon Climb and there was nothing. And then I Googled Herndon Climb and there was nothing. There was a Wikipedia page. And, and I kind of re-entered the conversation with him and said, hey, there's no book about the Herndon Climb. He said, yeah, I know. It would be a great book. That's why I called you. <laughs> And so we, uh, we, we decided to write the book, and uh, I did tell him that I was, uh, had been, it was a reservist, I was recalled to active duty, I said this is a, a huge time commitment, and we aren't going to be able to really start it until, uh, you know, I've kind of got my end uh, date in sight, and so we, we met periodically, and we kind of fleshed out ideas, but we really didn't start it in earnest until, uh, until I retired from the Navy. Thank you, Admiral. Next question, uh, with how long and somewhat arduous of a process that writing a book is, how much did the book change from your initial ideas to the, the final project? Well, you have to submit uh, for the aspiring authors out there, especially with the Naval Institute, uh, you have to submit a uh, outline of what, the, of what the book will be, a table of contents, uh, potential market, uh, a sample chapter, uh, and, I, and I guess it's okay now, it's published, but we did not follow the table of contents that we submitted. So what was really fascinating about the book was we, we had an idea of the type of thing we wanted to do. We wanted to give a, a history of, of, of who Herndon was, and Herndon, uh, Captain Herndon was a, a phenomenal uh, naval officer, you know, truly went down with the ship. And so we wanted to kind of give his background. Uh, Gary Kinder, who wrote our foreword, has an excellent book called Ship of Gold in the Deep Blue Sea, which talks about not only Captain Herndon and, and what happened on the SS Central America, but also the search for the ship. And they eventually recovered, recovered it and, and got a lot of the, the gold and things off of that. So we um, went, went through that, and we focused on um, trying to kind of figure out what a, what a non-Naval Academy or a non-military person would be interested in because there was some, some consideration to, hey, we don't want this to be an alumni book. And so Scott came up with the great idea of doing a second person uh, account of the climb, which is broken up into three chapters uh, for those that have never done it. So I thought that was, that, that was something we did keep. And, and I think probably the biggest thing that we, that we changed is that we, we had some ideas of some different climb stories, but... As I went out and searched for stories and went on social media and said, if anybody has any great stories about the Herndon climb, please let me know, uh, I got a lot of great support. 
And I had folks tell me, hey, have you heard about this class has climbed, this class has climbed. So a lot of, I, I got a lot of things that were, were actually better than the things that we had originally had talked about doing. One of the chapters we were going to do was the famous people that have, uh, have climbed Herndon, you know, maybe a Roger Staubach, maybe a John McCain, any famous people that graduated from the academy uh, other than Mr. Trainer. Uh, <laughs> But we, you know, when we started digging into that, it just we didn't have any legs there, and so uh, the the chapter that we that we that we're really proud of that we added later was the chapter uh, about women and and the women at the academy and their experience uh, in the early '80s. Uh, my wife, being a class of '86, uh, that was obviously near and dear to my heart, and I got several emails from women uh, from those early 80s classes who said, I have a story to tell. Are you going to tell my, and I'm willing to tell it, but are you going to tell the story of what we went through? Or are you going to sugarcoat it and make the Naval Academy look good? And I said, no, we're going to tell it how it was. And so uh, the chapter about the women at the Naval Academy in the 80s is one we're really proud of. And that's one that we had no idea uh, prior to submitting our proposal. Thank you, Admiral. Same question for Mr. Trainer. Yeah, if I can, Zach, let me just uh, comment on what Jim said. Um, for those of you that haven't read the book yet, uh, it is a fascinating read. And um, for alumni, uh, it's very interesting to, to learn a lot of things that uh, at least most of us, or at least me, uh, didn't, I didn't know. Um, that chapter on, on the women was both... Uh, uh, instructive and in many respects harrowing. I, I graduated in 68, so of course there weren't any women at the Naval Academy and there weren't for a long time to come. Um, so that was, uh, that was to me one of the most interesting parts of the book. So, um, If I still remember the question, what changed from uh, beginning <laughs> to end, uh, I guess there are a couple of different answers to that from my perspective because like I said, I had I had been kind of working on a uh, Vietnam-related uh, Vietnam novel um, for a lot of years, and eventually I just set that aside and started this new one around 2013 or 2014. And um, uh, I started with the idea that I was going to do the Vietnam part, but also a heavy emphasis on the, as it turned out, 10 years after the Marty McClure, the lead character, comes home. Uh, the process is very different for fiction. Um, with any press, including the Naval Institute Press, uh, you've got to have the whole book done before they'll even consider looking at it, at least for a first-time author. Um, and uh, so when I started the book, uh, I had some ideas on where I wanted it to go. Um, had multiple outlines of, of different areas, did a bunch of different chapters, and then ended up putting it all together in what I thought was going to be the format that I really wanted and the story that I wanted to, to have flow in a certain way. Um, so fast forward a couple of years, and I've got what I'm absolutely convinced in my naivete is the great American novel written here. It's 256,000 pages, or, or not pages, 256,000 words long. And then I start reading articles about publishers and uh, um, agents and all. And what is crystal clear in all of them is that the sweet spot for a novel is between 80 and 120,000 words. And I've got 256,000. I didn't believe it after I'd read several of these articles. I pulled, literally pulled a dozen books off the shelf did a word count in the books and found out, man, it's absolutely true. 110, 120,000 words. So I had to take a chainsaw to the 256,000 words to try and get it down uh, anywhere near uh, where it was going to be. And um, that took a couple of iterations. But beginning to end, from rough first draft to final draft, I did nine cover-to-cover -cover drafts on the book. Wow. So. And then a follow-up question to that, would you say it's more difficult uh, writing the book or, or cutting down what you've already written? Um, two very different processes, but uh, 
I find the actual getting the book from start to finish in the first draft to be much more difficult. I mean, that's really sitting there and just focusing and trying to figure out what it is that you want to say, um, how you can put it all together. And I really enjoy the revision process. I have to admit it was a little tough when I had to take a chainsaw and then a bandsaw and then a scalpel to the book later on. But um, uh, for me personally, uh, I'm in the throes of working on my second novel now, and I'm still in the first draft stage of it, and it's, it's much more difficult than revising for me. Thank you, sir. So next couple questions that will be more content specific uh, for the books, and we'll start with two for Admiral McNeil. Um, first question, so your book delves into the history of one of the Naval Academy's most memorable traditions and most important monuments. If you had to write a book on another Naval Academy tradition or monument, et cetera, what would it be and why? Well, I, I think that uh, you know, the Naval Academy being around since 1845 is, is full of tradition. And I think sometimes tradition is not necessarily viewed in, in, in a positive light. Uh, I think the Hernan Climb has, has kind of survived that. They're, there is a, a chapter uh, or a small chapter in the book about uh, the year uh, when Admiral Fowler was a superintendent that uh, he decided not to grease the monument. Uh, and, and, and as much as, as I hate to, hate to admit it, uh, you know, he makes some really good points. But when, when you look at tradition, traditions are really what make a school like this the school that it is. And Mark being class 68, my dad being class 62, uh, you know, we have things in common with, with our grads. We have the Link in the Chain program, which is the class that's 50, year, you know, 50 years apart, and there are lots of similarities. And that's, that's why I, I, I like the traditions, and, and I'm a very, I think people describe me as a traditional person. But to specifically answer your question, I think it would be absolutely fascinating to write uh, a book that uh, chronicled the uh, plebe indoctrination system, the plebe year, and how that has evolved uh, from, from the beginnings uh, in 1845 to, to, to where it is now. Uh, I think the research would be really interesting. There'd be lots of, certainly lots of great stories. And it would be, uh, uh, I think, eye-opening for a, a lot of people. You know, the old joke, which you actually don't hear anymore from the current mids, but if my dad was sitting here, he would say the class of 62 had the last plebe year and 68, 83, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, and they, the, the current mints don't view it that way. And whereas we, in, in our time, tended to maybe look upon it as, as kind of a badge of honor uh, to, to go through it, I think you know, maybe the current mids, Zach being class of 2015, maybe he w would want to share his thoughts, perhaps, although he is only the moderator, right? I, I, was, <laughs> I was told that because my plebe summer had air conditioning in Bancroft that I didn't have a real plebe year. So. <laughs> I guess that settles that part. Uh, you know, uh, James Webb's our, uh, Sense of Honor, the, the novel he wrote, Sense of Honor, which highlights the plebe indoctrination system in a fictional manner, uh, and which was actually banned. The Naval Academy would not have it in the mid-store when it first came out. Uh, later on, I, I, he actually did a book signing. I got it signed for my dad when I was a mid. I think the plebe indoctrination system would be a wonderful topic to trace it through the years. And, and as much as the, you know, the old timers, and I guess I'm officially an old timer now, uh, think that we had it tough, I'm sure that the you know, people from the class of 1914 may differ. <laughs> They're not going to comment on it very much, though. <laughs> um, and then you mentioned early on about the the, what you saw is the importance of tradition at, a, uh, at an institution like this. What impact do you hope that uh, your book has on Herndon, the understanding of it and its role at the Naval Academy? Well, you know, the, the, the history of the Herndon Monument, and uh, certainly want people to buy the book, so I don't want to do, do all the spoilers, but, uh, you know, he, the, the reason that it became a monument uh, was what he, he was such a selfless act of what he did. And there had been some instances of 
ships going down where the crew just basically got into the lifeboats and sailed away and left everyone to die. And so what Captain Herndon did by essentially getting all the women and children off, uh, every single one was saved. Uh, obviously lots of the men, men perished, including himself. Uh, there's a reason that there's a monument to that. And, and, and admittedly, uh, when Scott called me about the Herndon climb, and he said, Captain Herndon, you know, I, va I had some vague knowledge of it. So I think when you look at, you know, why is the Herndon climb important? I think it's, it's important from a, a team building standpoint. It's a, it's a symbol of your, your kind of last act of plebe year, because when you are finally done with the Herndon climb, you're now a midshipman fourth class instead of a plebe. So it's very, that's very symbolic from a, from a tradition standpoint. But also to understand that an institution like this that has been around as long as it's been, there are people that have come before us and you're part of, you know, the Army would call it the long gray line, uh, but you're part of something, you know, bigger than yourself. And I think that's why it's important to understand the Herndon climb and, and understand Herndon and just understand the whole tradition about Herndon. Absolutely. Thank you, Admiral. And then for Mr. Trainer, first, the platoon in your novel is constantly, in the first half of the book at least, is constantly struggling with the temptation to dehumanize both uh, the enemy as well as the, the local civilians in Vietnam. How much of that struggle uh, is, I guess, semi-autobiographical for you as a rifle platoon commander in Vietnam? I guess I'd answer that in a couple different ways, Zach, um, and clearly draw a distinction between the enemy and, and the uh, civilian population. Um, as far as dehumanizing the enemy, I, I'm not sure exactly what that means or what it would mean today. Um, you know, there's been a lot in the press about uh, name calling and that kind of thing, but uh, I'll tell you from a personal perspective, as well as from some experience, um, you know, when, when you spend week after week after week with people trying to kill you and you're trying to kill them, the fact that you call each other names sure doesn't mean much. Um, I think that's just, uh, that's just a reality on the ground. Um, I think that, uh, uh, there are certain ethical rules that everybody has to uh, adhere to. And I think for small unit leaders, I've had the opportunity in the last year or so, I, the book's being used in some of the leadership and ethics classes, and I've talked to a couple of them. The rules of engagement these days are fairly black and white, although my guess is that there's some gray area there too. Um, you know, the area that we worked in uh, in Vietnam, uh, that I worked in in Vietnam, um, was all uh, in and among various villages and things like that, spread quite far apart, but uh, still you'd go through villages whenever you were patrolling. And um, let me digress for one second to say that the book isn't autobiographical. Um, it's fiction, none of the characters really exist. Um, but it's based on a fair amount of experience, and uh, at least the first half. And, um, you know, just one little story when it comes to uh, how the, the Marines, and you're talking about 18, 19, 20-year-old kids for the most part here that are suddenly picked up, thrown down in an environment that they have very little uh, real preparation for. And... Um, uh, you know, for example, uh, we would have people killed or wounded uh, by booby traps, they call them IEDs today, um, as we went through villages and all, and you never had any idea who set, who set them. Um, I once ran seven straight patrols and lost one or more Marines every time. We never saw anybody to shoot at on one of those patrols who was setting the booby traps. We had no idea. It, but I can tell you that for 19-year-old kids or 22-year-old lieutenants, um, it doesn't make you a nicer person 
um, and it, it certainly makes you a very wary and very um, distrustful uh, and angry person when you go through an experience like that. And I think that was a constant, in, uh, at least in, the, in uh, much of the area and, and uh, First Marine Division's area. So um, you know, I think uh, one of the things I, I talked to uh, Mids today about is a, a small unit leader's responsibility is to enforce um, ethical and moral constraints in his unit under incredibly difficult circumstances. But they have to do it. Um, and, it's a, and it's a real challenge. So I think that, uh, you know, the shorter answer to your question is that that part of the book is based on reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, along that, I guess, line of thought, some of the themes in the book, whether it's that struggle to differentiate civilians from combatants and how do you handle civilians to reintegrating to society, um, to the, sort of these philosophical questions of whether or not the, the loss of a, a platoon mate was, was worth it in the bigger picture, um, I think a lot of those will, will resonate with, with veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, were any of your themes in the book, you think you would have written a different book uh, in an alternate reality where the last two decades of conflict had not happened? I don't think the last two decades of conflict really influenced the way I wrote the book, but I was very conscious um, as I got into it that I was hopeful that it would have some some universal meaning to it. And uh, you know, it's one of the reasons that I did it uh, with the protagonist as, uh, as uh, a young PFC instead of an officer, uh, even though I had been an officer. Um, I do like the lieutenant in the book, but he's not the, uh, the major <laughs> focus of it. Um, but uh, uh, it has been very gratifying to me and a little bit surprising um, kind of a hope come true, I suppose. Um, I have heard from any number of veterans of uh, infantry and other ground combat in both Iraq and Afghanistan, several of whom have actually used the phrase, this book is about us. Hmm. Um, so I, I think that in many ways, uh, the experience in, in combat doesn't change from decade to decade, uh, war to war. The homecoming has certainly changed. The young men and women coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan got a much better welcome than Vietnam veterans did, you know, light years beyond what Vietnam veterans did. Having said that, I think some of that is still on the surface level, though. I think that, uh, that people don't take the time, don't have the interest, don't... Uh, have the ability to really understand what we ask of our 19 and 20 year old kids when we send them to war and what they live with when they come home. I personally firmly believe that the overwhelming majority, and, and studies have shown this to be true, of combat veterans don't have, I draw a distinction between PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and PTS. You can't go through what we ask of our young people in combat and not have some sort of post-traumatic stress afterwards. You just can't. I, I firmly believe that. I don't believe that for the overwhelming majority of us, it ever rises to the level of disorder. And that was, that was what I was really trying to say in the book, is that Marty goes through a pretty hellacious uh, period of time in Vietnam and he comes back, he's got some nightmares, he's got some thoughts that uh, uh, he's really wrestling with, he's got doubts, um, but he goes on, he, you know, he goes to school, he, uh, he has a very responsible job that he does well, he's got a loving family, a wife, and I think that's a much better and more accurate depiction of both Vietnam veterans and today's veterans than what we often see in the, in the uh, press. Thank you, sir. And then a follow-up to your point about uh, 
the feedback you've gotten from recent veterans who, who you know, see themselves and their units in your book about Vietnam. If you had written uh, the same novel or tried to write the same novel about Afghanistan, do you think there'd be any you know, major differences in, in, what, uh, in your themes? I, I think that uh, the intensity of, of what young people go through um, in combat would still be a drumbeat theme throughout the, a book on a topic like that. Um, but I think that, uh, I think our troops that have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan are much better prepared um, in many respects for, for what they face. I think that would change some attitudes and some approaches to what they go through. You know, they have, they have multi-month, for the most part, they have multi-month workups when they, uh, before they deploy and, um, and they go over as units. We went over and stepped off a plane one by one, and that's the way we came home. The homecoming is very different too, so I think that those things would, would vary. I think we do a, a much better job today of uh, preparing um, our troops to go to war uh, in the small units and, um, and a much better job of, of decompressing them when they come home. So I think that, that aspect of it would change. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, well, then I think before we go to the Q&A, we can uh, end with, for both of you gentlemen, any uh, future book plans underway? Go ahead, Mark. I like your idea, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to do it. You are. Um, yes, I'm, I'm working, and it actually ties in a little bit with your question, but only very tangentially, Zach, to what you just asked me. I'm working currently on a second novel, and it's about... Uh, Marines in Afghanistan, but with a greater, a much greater emphasis on the home front mm. than the actual uh, war, although that's part of it. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Admiral McNeil. Yeah, so uh, Scott's wife, Nancy, is, as I describe in the acknowledgments, kind of the unsung hero of our book. She did, the, uh, did a lot of interviews for, for our Herndon book, and she did the transcription. And that's for anybody that's done that, listening to, to a recording and then transcribing it. It's, it's very much pick and shovel work. And she did it uh, uh, with, without a complaint. And she also did a lot of our research. So she came back because uh, we were really trying to figure out how, the world, how in the world this whole Herndon Climb thing started. And we never really found a smoking gun that said, you know, some sort of edict that we were going to do, the, you know, that the mids were going to do this. Uh, but we did kind of piece together how we think it kind of happened. And part of that was uh, doing research at the Nimitz Library and looking at old reef points, you know, 1910 reef points and special collections and things like that. So uh, we, we went from there. We came to the, to the Institute and found uh, pictures to put in the book. Uh, so we, most of the pictures were, were pictures that uh, Naval Institute had already. Uh, and then we walked uh, down on the other, you know, the other side of the hill and walked back to, you know, walked back over by the library. And I walked by uh, Senator McCain and Admiral Larson's grave, and they're buried side by side. And I had this epiphany: wouldn't that make a great book? And so I kind of tucked that away. And I have a, a friend. Uh, so Scott wanted. I, I pitched the idea to Scott, and Scott wanted to take a break. He had some other projects he wanted to work on. And I have a friend, uh, Eric Smith, a classmate, uh, fellow Supply Corps officer, and we didn't know each other at the academy. We met at Supply Corps school, and he's a, a prolific writer, has written lots of different things, his blog, and, and just a, a really brilliant, brilliant writer. And so I pitched him on the idea uh, to, to work on it with me, and, and he said yes. And then I was with, uh, having lunch with Claude Barraby, the former director of the Naval Academy Museum, and he asked me about the next book, and I told him about this idea of uh, uh, the Senator McCain and, and, and Admiral Larson. And for those that don't know, uh, Admiral Larson was four-star admiral. He was superintendent when we were here and then came back again after the cheating scandal in the mid-'90s, was retired as a four-star admiral. Uh, and Senator McCain, I think most people know, was uh, a bit of a scallywag, fifth from the bottom of his class, uh, but they were best friends. And so I just thought it was a, an interesting contrast between Two midshipmen, you know, two two people had very different experiences as midshipmen, uh, and both rose to levels of success, uh, albeit in, in, in different areas. And so when I talked to to Claude about it, he said, "Do you think that could make a whole book?" 
And I said, I don't know. He says, well, there's other great stories like that. And I said, like what, for example? And he said, well, uh, Admiral Crow and Admiral Stockdale are buried side by side in the Naval Academy Cemetery, and they have an interesting story. And so it, it evolved from being about Sir McCain and, and Admiral Larson to a series of, of vignettes, a series of chapters about various people that have been buried side by side. Uh, so the, the, tie, the working title is Perpep Perpetual Proximity, uh, Side by Side Graves in the American Stories They Tell. And interestingly enough, the Admiral Larson and Senator McCain chapter, that's not in our chat, it's not gonna be in the book. Uh, we, we found some things that were a little bit uh, different that we wanted to go in a different direction. But that's uh, the next book uh, that I have coming out, um, will be out uh, beginning of 2023. So we owe the manuscript, nonfiction is always about 75,000 words and we, could, we get away with just a sample chapter <laughs> and we're always trying to stretch it. There's no cutting involved, we're stretching it. So the, the latest chapter is a little sneak preview the, the latest chapter we're working on now is about uh, Douglas Monroe, who is the only Coast, Guard, uh, Coast Guardsman who won the Medal of Honor, who has won the Medal of Honor, he won it in World War II. And uh, he is buried uh, side by side with, uh, next to his mother. And when his mother got the word that he had, had passed away, he was killed at Guadalcanal. When, he, when his mother heard that, that you know, got the news that he had passed away and was killed in action, she joined the Coast Guard as a 48-year-old mother and went through basic training with all the kids and joined the Coast Guard and ended up having a career in the Coast Guard to honor her son. So that's the type of stories that we're looking at doing, the interesting stories, and, and, and again, the, the common theme being, being that uh, you know, they, they decided in, 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 in death to be buried side by side. Pretty cool story. Um, all right, so that finishes with the, that's my question. So uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Can I ask Mark a question? Go ahead. Sure. Hmm. <laughs> so, and this may seem silly, so part, pardon my silly question. So when I, when, I read a, when I read a novel, there's a lot of different names. Marty McClure, and how do you come up with those names? There's a bunch of names. So yeah. do you go to the phone book? Do these people you know? Uh, I, I don't, and, and are you trying, is it just random, or is there, is there supposed to be some sort of method to the madness? I've never understood that. My guess is it varies from author to author. There's only one name in the book uh, that is actually of a, a person that I know. Um, I'm not sure where Marty McClure and his wife Patty came from. Uh, they'd been around for 20 years in my head of characters. Um, some of the others, there's a fellow that, uh, that I really liked a great deal in the book and uh, um, I was making him kind of a, a swarthy Italian guy. He reminded me of someone that I had known. Um, and uh, I came up, his name was uh, John, but I decided that it would just be fun and would give me something to play with in writing it if his mother had named him after two popes. So he's named Pius John Garifano. Um, others, and a couple of the last names, I literally... Um, went to, uh, and I'm not sure why I did this, but um, just thinking through names, uh, I literally went at one point for one character to, uh, in the back of a large Webster's Dictionary, there's a list of surnames. And I actually went through and I was trying to come up with something. Um, on, uh, and I don't recall exactly why, whether I wanted alliteration on the name or whatever it was, but uh, so it was a pretty random uh, approach to it, to be honest. And the names changed throughout the book, throughout the drafts, because I'd go through with a character and realize, mm, no, that just doesn't work for who this person is, and rightly or wrongly went back and changed it beginning to end. But Marty stayed the same. Marty stayed the same. Yeah. All right. I have a oh. Question. <laughs> Who 
Jim. A, a great question. So we, we really tr treated it as, a, as a job. And one of the things that we realized early on, and it's kind of uh, like making a, a date to have lunch with somebody and you see them, hey, let's get lunch. And then six months later, hey, I thought we were going to get lunch. Uh, you have to be very deliberate about it. And so we realized early on that we really needed to be on a, on a regular drum beat. And so we set up a call uh, every week uh, based on the time difference. I think it was 11 o'clock Eastern on Thursday, 8 o'clock. He was, he's in California where I grew up. And we, kept, we, we were religious about that call. And we, we, you know, we each had things going on in our lives and travel and different things, but we, we made sure that was blocked out in our calendar and it was a lot of accountability also. And again, Mark wrote by himself, but we're writing with someone else and, and, and having a partner, there's a certain amount of accountability of, oh, wait a second, we're talking tomorrow. Have I done what I said I was going to do? And I think that at least for, at least for me and Scott, Scott and I, we decided that, look, we're, we, we have a deadline. We need to make the deadline. And if we just, if we just go you know, kind of stumble and bumble along, we're not going to make it. So we were just very, very deliberate about what uh, our schedule was. And we stuck to a schedule. And we held each other accountable. And so I think that was definitely one of the lessons learned. And the other one is I talked a little bit about how the, the, the table of contents changed. And, and I, I initially... Uh, viewed it as you know, really a history of the Herndon climb, and really getting into uh, a, a lot of uh, you know, without uh, you know, the fluff of the climb stories. And at, at and, and, and at some point, Scott said, "So what you want to do is write a textbook about the Herndon climb." I said, "That's going to be." He said, "That's going to be a bestseller." And I, he said, "We have to spice this thing up. We have to make it interesting. Be, an interesting book is part of the marketing thing." I think Robin would agree. So, <laughs> so we had our plan, but in answer to your question, sir, we we also changed it. So we 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 made changes. We we changed things on the fly. Uh, we were constantly revising it. Uh, I think again, I think it's different with nonfiction than fiction. You know, Scott made the comment uh, at one of our uh, editorial meetings. Uh, you know, cutting cutting a word from his fiction is is like cutting off an arm. You know, he he just every word he writes is is precious and it's perfect, and so he doesn't want to do any cutting. <laughs> but from a nonfiction standpoint, constantly trying to revise it, make it more interesting, and not being I guess the answer is not be wedded to the original idea and be be open to changing it based upon the flow of the book. Uh, even with the the current book we're working on, it's very military uh, centric. Uh, you know, we have you know, World War II stories. We have a story about Apollo 1 astronauts, uh, uh, different things like that. Now we're like, hey, should we put in something that uh, is some civilian you know, stories? And, and so we're just kind of, uh, of changing it as we go. And I think that where originally when I started, I kind of thought, no, this is our plan. We've got to stick to the plan. But I think you need to be open to change to make it the best possible book you can. I think from my perspective, with, with fiction, it's probably uh, uh, even more of a uh, uh, process that you really have to, at least I imagine this, that you really have to just discipline yourself to work at it continually. I, I agree with, with Jim, but I'd, I'd take it a step beyond. You know, with fiction, you spend a lot of time just staring at a blank page because you're just making stuff up. <laughs> conversations between people that don't exist and then you go to the dinner table and you wonder where the heck they are, you know, why didn't they show up? Um, but I think some of the things that I learned and I wish I had known earlier, I mentioned a little bit ago, is uh, how a book ought to be about 110,000 words instead of 256,000. That would have changed life a little bit for me. Um, but I also found that, uh, at least for me, there was a fair amount of study that needed to be done. After I had done the first couple of drafts of the book, um, and this was still back in the 250,000 word era, um, I thought I had a, a fairly decent story. But then I sat down and I took three or four very good literary novels and I literally studied them, literally took them apart, 
so that I could figure out why somebody did something on page 47 that related uh, to page 189, you know, and back and forth, and uh, literally tore the books apart to figure out how these good authors had actually done it. That dramatically changed the way that I rewrote the next couple drafts of the book. So um, there's no substitute for the hours that you have to spend in the chair. And I think if you want to do it in what I perceive to be the right way at any rate, um, you've really got to do a lot of learning to get there. We do have a mic. We do have a mic um, in the front if anybody would like to ask a question from the audience. Uh, that's great insights. Uh, my name is Chip Wallen, and I'm a father of a graduate here at the Naval Academy. So a question for both of you, having, having both been alumni here and having served and then having careers and then finally writing books towards uh, after all of that, what advice would you give to midshipmen about the importance of writing now as a young person? Yeah, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, I, as Zach mentioned, I teach a, uh, as an adjunct, teach a, a sophomore leadership class, a youngster leadership class in ethics. It's a lot of the things that you talked about, Mark, with uh, you know, you know, the, the moral dilemmas that, that, the, that some of the guys face in, in the book uh, really brought home for me, and I'm going to bring them into my, in, into my class. But we really focus on writing and, and re really getting to this idea of journaling and, and writing, because I, I think with, and I don't want to sound like the, like the old guy, get off my lawn guy, uh, but with you know, emails and text messages, you know, the art of writing is, is, is kind of rapidly, you know, be, becoming a lost art. And so when, you, when you're a young naval officer, that's the way that you communicate. And that's the way that, and, and not only are, are you going to make, uh, do well for yourself, but as I tell the mids and I tell people that work for me, the best thing we can do is, as officers and, and the people that we, that we lead is to get them promoted. That's the number one thing we can do. We can give them awards, we can give them time off, we can give them all these different things, but the way that you truly take care of your people is get them promoted. And the only way you can get them promoted is by writing evaluations on them, fit reps on them, fitness reports that uh, allow them to rise to the top. And so you have to be a good writer in, in order to do that if you wanna be a good leader. And so I really stress that with my mids that I understand you know, see you there, see with you there. I, I understand that in a text message, that's good, but you can't do that in, in a professional writing uh, arena. I think it's, it's crucial that uh, if people want to advance in any profession, whether it's the military or in my case, for example, law and then uh, uh, corporate business, um, you've got to be able to communicate and a great deal of that has to be communication and writing. And so in that sense, I think it's really important that, uh, that mids know how to write. Taking it up a level, um, looking at the Naval Institute Press and all, as well as other uh, venues that are available to them as midshipmen and then clearly as junior officers. You know, if you take a look across the, uh, the population of people that who have gone on to fantastic careers, most of them have done some sort of writing, one sort or another, and they're sharing their knowledge. But I think at the same time, what writing does, whether I've done a little bit of, a, of a nonfiction writing, um, nothing like Jim's, but a little bit. And uh, I, I think whether it's fiction or nonfiction, it forces you to find out what you really think about something. And I think that's, that's very important. It's a great, uh, a great way to learn things. And it's a great way to teach other people. So um, the other thing I'd add is that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it can look like, particularly on a longer work, it can look like a very daunting task. Um, but it can be done. Uh, we're all, or the two of us are proof of that, you know. <laughs> very busy schedules. Um, uh, but if you, if you want to do it, you just have to discipline yourself to, to number one, figure out how it is done, do some studying, and number two, put in the hours to get it done. Anybody else? I actually have a, a quick follow-up from Mr. Trainer on balance. <laughs> okay. um, so I teach the, the freshman 
government course here, and I also really emphasize academic writing is professional writing, right? The importance of written communication with them. Um, but you mentioned uh, how the writing process helps you realize and clarify to you what you what you think. Um, having written both, you know, fiction but also some nonfiction, do you think that those two types of processes do different things for the writer? I, I think they do. I think that uh, you know, fiction. One of the the interesting things or the the great things I think about fiction is that you can um, you can develop themes and ideas uh, just by your characters' actions and thoughts that are very difficult to convey in a strictly factual format. Um, the interior dialogue, if you will. And I think while you're figuring out what Sam or Sally here is trying to, or, or is thinking about something or what they're, they're planning, it helps you figure out um, what would a person in those circumstances do. As far as the, the nonfiction, I'm, I'm thinking more of, uh, you know, for example, on the business front, I always found I was a, um, an executive in a very large corporation, and I always found it amazing that uh, people who had been through business school and all um, really couldn't put together uh, as as understandable a memo, you know, a multi-page memo to uh, to senior execs or to other people. They couldn't communicate what they wanted because they hadn't really focused on thinking it through. They were good folks. They knew exactly how to accomplish something, but they couldn't put it on a page. Um, and I found that uh, uh, if they had to do that, if they had to go back and redo something like that, they came up with new ideas on how to do things better. So I think there's lots of benefits to it. And I'd like to, if I could just add one more thing, and back to, back to your question, sir. Uh, one of my deployments as a reservist, uh, I was in, it was in Kuwait, and I, and I worked for a two-star uh, Army general. And as a two-star Army general, he had a staff, and he had a, an Air Force colonel that worked for him who was an a unbelievably eloquent writer. And so when we got an email from, from the general that was well-written, we knew it came from Bob, <laughs> the Air Force colonel. Because when the general would send us an email that he wrote, it was usually three or four sentences and it ended with hua. And, and I, think, I think that, it, and I'm not making a comment about this general, but I think a lot of times uh, you have operational people that view the admin and view that thing as, as being, well, that's a, that's a soft skill and I'm a combat leader or I'm, I'm, I'm a this or I'm a that, I'm operational, and I don't need to worry about that stuff. But that stuff... If you're truly going to be a great leader, that stuff is just as important as being a, a, you know, a great operational leader. Okay. Thank you all for an excellent discussion. I now invite our guests to join us topside on the rooftop terrace for lunch. You'll have the opportunity, if you haven't already, to buy A Quiet Cadence and The Herndon Climb and to have the authors sign your book. Um, the rooftop terrace is a gentle flight and a half upstairs um, against the celestial wall. There's also an elevator on the other side of the back of this studio, and um, my colleagues will be happy to uh, guide you. Thank you so much. We've enjoyed hosting you. <laughs>